All right, we are back. Uh, my name is Seth Juarez, and one of my favorite topics of all time is AI. For those of you here in person, we're jumping into two back-to-back -back segments on this. If you're joining online, you'll be able to stream the .NET Platform Overview and Roadmap with Scott Hunter right after this. First up is Corporate Vice President of Azure AI, Eric Boyd. How are you doing, bud? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Good. We hang out a lot because, or at least I try to hang out with you a lot, but it's it's awkward sometimes. I, I don't really like you. Yeah, and that's what he told me, but I feel like I'm able to overcome that. with Seth my... is an amazing guy, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, he's... but look it. One of the cool things about AI is that everyone is all of a sudden doing AI. Like when I started talking about this stuff 10 years ago, they're like, well, what is this machine learning stuff, which is a subset of AI. What is our philosophy with AI here at Azure? Sure. So when we think about how we're going to build our products, um, it all starts with innovation. And so leveraging all the great work that happens from Microsoft Research and the years of work that they've been doing to really push the envelope. You know, we talk about this in a number, you've heard it in a number of keynotes, first to human parity across about six different fields. Most recently, the conversational Q&A uh, contest at Stanford from earlier this mm -hmm. year that we're the only ones at human parity. We won that contest and, and no one else is, is really even close. And so we take that innovation and then we test it at scale with our products. When you look at all of the vast set of products that Microsoft has across Bing, across Azure, across you know, Windows and Office, and it goes on and on. All of those are increasingly using AI in them. And so we get to really make sure that it works at scale. And then when we think about the areas that we're really going to invest in, we really kind of have three lenses that we look through. The first is we want to make sure we're making people more productive. Mm -hmm. Regardless of your skill level with AI, if you're a novice and new to the field, or if you've been doing it for a decade, we want to help you get more productive, get your models built faster, manage them in production better. Um, so productivity is a key thing we think about. The second uh, lens we think through is enterprise scale. You know, we've been really fortunate as a company to work with thousands of enterprises and really learn from them what does it take to deploy things at scale, to integrate with their existing systems, and how to help them migrate and, and really bring them on this journey. And so we really focus a lot on that. And third lens, and probably the most important, is trust. At Microsoft, we operate under some of the most stringent privacy policies in the industry, and we have a, a, a compliance portfolio uh, that no one else matches in the industry. And so we really make sure that we are a trusted partner to help you really feel secure that your data, your systems, your models are all going to be managed properly. And this is important, right? Because I, I spoke with, with Lance Olson, who works on some of the cognitive right. services stuff, and he said, we do not use our customers' data to build our cognitive services. N absolutely not. Our customers' data is their data. And so when we're building our cognitive services, if we need the training data, we'll go and find it, we'll buy it, we'll find the right places to sort of source it from. But if customers come to us, they, we make ironclad promises to them about how we're going to use their data. And, uh, you know, that's, we take that stuff very seriously. And, and I'm, this is like serious. Like if, for those of you that are watching, I, one time I saw an email, they're like, hey, we're not very strong in whatever language because it was for translation. They're like, we need to hire some people to do some transcription. And it's not like, hey, let's go read our customers' emails to do this. It's basically, we're going to do the right thing ethically with AI. I, I couldn't even imagine suggesting to read yeah, our yeah, customers' he, emails. He got really like, that. ah, ah, that's not something we do. Okay, so basically, we have those investments. Uh, what are we talking about now at Build for AI? Man, there is so much going on. Like, I, when I have been trying to outline the different things we've done, it's just kind of a laundry list. Right. So, I mean, I start with cognitive services. Uh, we have the broadest portfolio of cognitive services of anyone in the industry across speech, language, web search. Uh, and we've added a new category around decision. And so decision is really helping you, instead of just sensing the world, the, the you know, vision and language and things like that, this is helping you actually make decisions. Right. And so a key service we're rolling out there is called Personalizer. This is a service we've used at Xbox to help recommend you know, what games should people play next or what actions should they take. Uh, and it had a huge uplift for them. And it's based on reinforcement learning. And so the great thing about reinforcement learning is you don't have to start with that massive data set to train from. Right. 
it learns from interactions with the users. So when a new game comes out, if I don't have massive amounts of training data, it's hard to know who's going to want to play that. But reinforcement learning will learn with interactions super fast and then really tailor that to all of its individual users. So we've done that with Xbox, mm -hmm. and now that's available uh, in preview for people with a really simple API to just go ahead and integrate with. Cool. Other cognitive services, uh, I, I mean, I heard Scott, yep. who was on before me, he talked about Ink Recognizer. So really bringing pen and paper into your applications so that you can recognize both the text as well as the drawings that they're going to do and sort of help bring that to life. Um, so a whole bunch going on in the cognitive services space. We, I mean, updates across basically all of our categories. There are new things happening. Right. I, and I, I love, like I said, I love cognitive services. It is the, you can go on the website and actually upload your own things and see it do the right thing, which is pretty amazing. It's super low barrier. Everyone can use AI. Yeah. You're going to say there's some more things. I mean, as I said, that's just the start of it, right? So then we have uh, another area that we talk about of cognitive search. And so cognitive search is helping companies unlock all the value they have in their documents by using these cognitive services we just talked about to do OCR against them, to, to extract the entities, and then to draw the relationship graphs to see how everything connects to itself. And uh, so that's now in GA. Uh, we announced it earlier. And the GA version is 30 times faster than the previous what? version, which is pretty awesome. That's cool. So we're very excited about that. Um, and one type of document that customers have a lot of is forms. Now, I don't know about you, but I go to the dentist. Yep. I hate the dentist. Um, and you know, you fill out the insurance form, and you write. And what happens? You hand it to the admin, who then literally types, types it, it in. in. Yeah. And this, and there's so many forms like that. If you think about expense reporting, you take your receipt and you type in the data from it. If you think about all the invoices that companies get, there's so many pieces of paper, uh, and even electronic copies locked up in PDFs and things like that. And so, what Form Extractor does is it takes you know, those forms, and you just give it about five forms as samples to sort of learn from. And then it gives you a representation of those forms, the, the, you know, in JSON or in tabular form, that then you can go and do, you effectively put it into a database. You can do something interesting with it. Right. And so we've had a ton of interest from companies about around that area. Um, that, that is one of my favorite. I mean, like, literally, this is one of the single biggest, every one of you has filled out a form, right? I mean, who has filled out a form before? Everyone's like, I'm not raising my hand, Seth. It's after lunch and I'm tired. <laughs> You've all filled out forms. All of you people watching and fill out forms. If you're the person that has to like read it and type it in, it's the worst. What, right? And with handwriting recognition and forms, you can do a lot of stuff. And what I love about this is, you know, we love to talk about these um, super cool demos of AI, of things that you're just like, wow, like they're drones flying all over pipelines and things like this. And but this is so applicable to every single business, right? This is AI that people can go and use today. Um, and so that's, that's, I really love the, the, just the applicability of it. Though. Yeah, and if you want to do like a killer robot, you can buy like a plastic robot and say, this is my AI too. You, I mean, you can do that. But the useful AI, we're building a lot of that. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing for developers, right? Because now we're in this really interesting phase where Data scientists and developers now somehow need to meet someone in the middle because Absolutely. there's usefulness now in AI, like you just talked about. What are we doing to help bridge that gap? Yeah, so I mean, we talked about the ways that we're using cognitive services to sort of help make things easier. But a lot of times, people are building their own models. Right. And, and you sort of touched on it. The model development process is often a data scientist goes off in a lab and creates some model, and then he throws it over the wall to a developer to go and turn it into executable code. So what we've really been focusing on with Azure Machine Learning is how do we just simplify this process? Because there are a lot of places where you know, people, we don't have enough data scientists in the industry. And so we need to expand the pool of people who can create models. And then another key focus for us is really you know, how do we do the end-to-end -end experience to really simplify the operation of this? And we build all that on a platform where we're really committed to being open. Uh, any tool, any technology, any framework you want to use, we want to bring that in. And so I like there are a couple of things I can talk about right. in, in sort of new developments that we have. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, automated machine learning is a capability we announced a year ago. That's we right. GA'd last December. Um, we've now put a UI on it. So it's literally a code-free way that you can go and build a model. You take a data set, you upload it, and you say, I want to optimize housing prices in King County. It's, right. You know, I want to predict them yeah. because I want to know what my house is worth. If I take the last 10 years of housing prices and just say predict on that, 
I will get a model that is built using the latest techniques for how you can go and build these models. And this is for developers that maybe won't, don't have a data scientist in-house. Am I understanding this right? It's both for developers. It's also for, you know, even if you're a data science expert, we've come up with a whole bunch of places where people need to build 50 models that are right. all pretty similar. You know, I need a category for each of my grocery store's items oh, to predict what, when they're going to run out. And now I can automate building 50 models in a row that are going to all perform with very high accuracy. And, and most people don't know this, but data scientists, we basically cry under our desk when things don't work, and we spend weeks and weeks and weeks doing what automated machine learning will do in a couple of hours, which is try a bunch of machine learning algorithms, try a bunch of hyperparameter hyper configurations, and then say, that's the best one. That's right. And so just being able to automate that process you know, really simplifies things. But then, all right, now you've got your model. Now what do you do? Yeah. Now I need to get it into production. And so this concept that we've been calling MLOps, the industry's calling it too, sort of related to DevOps, right? This how do I have a continuous life cycle of development, but it's different for models. Like, yeah. What do I check into source, so source control? Is it the code to generate the model? Is it the data that I use? Is it the model oh, itself? It's, yeah. Like, how do you think about those things? And then, you know, when the auditor comes and says, hey, you get granted insurance to, or you denied insurance to this person, why did you do that? And you're like, well, I don't know. That was seven months ago. And the what AI model did, did we it. have? <laughs> and what was it based on? And how do I go back and even understand how do I reproduce that? So we've integrated with Azure DevOps to really make that whole process of managing the life cycle of model deployment, model management, and even integration of the data scientists and the developers so much simpler. So we think the, the simplicity as well as the focus on the end-to-end -end life cycle is really going to make things easier for developers. That's awesome. And so let's talk about like when, because we have about three minutes left, when people are actually, because it seems a little mysterious, right? When the AI comes out, it's like, well, what is, what format is it in? Is it a file? It's probably a zip file, everyone's guessing, right? We don't know what's in there, but there's basically an artifact that comes out of the machine learning process. What happens to that? Can you tell us about what our, our thinking, our philosophy is on that? Sure. I mean, in essence, what is a model? It's a series of weights and a topology for how data flows through them. Yep. Um, but people don't really want to think about it like that. What they really want is something that they can run. Right. And so by putting it in a container and by making it easy to take that container on-prem, on the cloud, on the edge, and making that really simple, and then instrumenting it. Because one of the things you always need to do is watch the data that sort of flows back through to see, hey, is, is this data that I now am seeing in production, is that different than the data that I trained right. on? And so we've got a lot of things to really simplify that process. And that, that's the cool part, right? Because a lot of the work that I did when I was doing these kinds of models, it's like, here you go, and then something happens. I never know if it works, and now what if the data's different? What if th There's a lot of problems with that. Being able to see an end-to-end -end process for that is really nice. And you're saying it's an Azure pipeline. Uh, it, right, so Azure Machine Learning is integrated with Azure DevOps. There's an extension to Azure DevOps to simplify that, along with Azure Pipelines, which makes it really easy to reproduce the generation and the models that you're using. Awesome, so we have a question uh, coming in. How does Form Recognizer do with lower qual quality PDF? The examples are unrealistically good, he says. <laughs> so, I mean, that's going to be a tricky question, right? Like, if you have terrible looking image and you can't read it, then you can't read it. Um, the OCR that we use is industry leading. Yeah. And so we've benchmarked it against all of the competition and it outperforms all of them from word error rates and word recognition rates. Um, so it does really, really well. It does better in many cases than people will do looking at that same text. But uh, of course, if there's no signal in the data, there's yeah. no signal in the data. And it, I mean, if we can't read it as humans, the computer won't be able to. That's absolutely right. You know, and this is, it's a product that we have out in preview. Um, and we have a roadmap for it too, for how are we going to improve it? How are we going to enable people to customize it, to sort of add more data, to label it and things like that in the future? Um, so we expect a lot more to come on that too. All right, we have about 50 seconds. If someone wanted to do something with AI today and they're just an enthusiast, what, what should they do? I mean, it really, if you've never started with AI, the things that I would look at are how do I use cognitive services or how can I use automated machine learning, the new UX for it? But honestly, you know, 
go to the expo floor and check out all our section. We have a ton of booths where you can connect with people. Um, we have a whole bunch of sessions. I have a session at 3.30. We'll all be walking through all the different things we just talked about. Um, there's a lot of ways you can go learn. And now in 10 seconds, if you're a data scientist. If I'm a data scientist, I'm going to start with Azure Machine Learning, and I'm going to use that to really operationalize the models that I'm building. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for being with us.